friends. Hello, America. Welcome to your Leo Nation. Your Leo Nation is where we believe in the rule of law, a civil society, self-responsibility, and we unabashedly support the men and women who do the job to ensure that civil society. I am your host, the Chief Mark Garrett. I am once again so excited to be here as I always am. We seem to keep knocking it out of the park with amazing guests. Today is just uh, no exception. Uh, we have today a State Representative Tom Lackey, California State Representative Tom Lackey. Uh, done a great job for the people of California, continues to do it. Tom, thank you so much for being here today, and it's a privilege. Well, thank you. It's, it's exciting to be here and join you today. Thanks so much. You know, we'll talk a little bit about your, your background, but I'll go ahead and, and kick it off a little bit here. You know, Tom and I actually worked, well, not actually physically together in the same station ever, but we were actually on the California Highway Patrol at the same time, time, Tom, a little before me, and I retired a little before me, uh, looks younger than me, but he came on before I did. So we actually worked in the same, the same law enforcement uh, uh, agency. For a number of years, Tom, I believe he did 28 years of the California Highway Patrol, retires as sergeant. And this is a gentleman who uh, today represents the people of California in the legislative sense, and at one time was an executive in the law enforcement role. So he's seen it from both sides and, and I think is as qualified as anybody to talk about a civil society and the rule of law. Um, so we are glad to have him today. There, Tom, there was something that you, you and I briefly spoke about this, you know, getting ready for the podcast, something that caught my attention a little while back. It's still going through the mill of um, the state legislature, and that is uh, SB or Senate Bill 1273, also known as Eliminating Unnecessary Police Interaction in Schools. And... The person who authored this so-called bill um, is State Senator Stephen Bradford. Now, just so you know, Tom, I've dealt with this character when I was a chief, assistant chief, and captain here in Los Angeles because he's from Southern California. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let you, you know, kind of take it away just right now about Stephen Bradford, and you can you can talk about this. So we'll kind of get into the meat and potatoes or the weeds more accurately of this bill. So. What do you want to tell us about Stephen Bradford? Well, it's, he's actually a very nice person with a very uh, lopsided view of, uh, well, public safety in general. He And he happens to be the chair on the Senate side of the Public Safety Committee, which is really quite ironic um, because, quite frankly, public safety is not really their interest. It should It's more like inmate safety that they're focused on. Uh, they like to, to protect the arrested. And, um, you know, I... To some degree, I, I'm all about being fair to the arrested, but in the same right, I also believe that justice calls for a uh, remedy. And remedy means usually removing them from society for a period of time um, so that society can relax and maybe that they can get their mind in order and their, their perspective in order. But nonetheless, um, Mr. Bradford is missing the mark on so many fronts. Uh, it's unfortunate because his life experience must be filled with uh, all sorts of uh, negative in negative encounters with law enforcement because he actually despises law enforcement. I don't, I'm, he would uh, claim to the contrary, but it is a fact. Um, and he also sees a lot of things um, through a racial lens. And uh, I, I do believe that uh, we need to be sensitive when we consider these, these uh, perspectives because uh, I, I do believe that there are some things we need to do to improve race relations from all sides. Um, but nonetheless, when uh, there's no sense of balance, uh, we get uh, imbalanced policy. And we, we are the lawmakers and we are to consider all aspects of, uh, of an issue before we, we take action. And his uh, particular bill that you're focusing on is absolutely to the point of absurd in, in all truth. It is very... Uh, counterintuitive to any kind of justice. Uh, well, you're right. Let me let me just share with the audience just, uh, some tidbits, some pieces from Mr. Bradford's 
bill that he authored and and you touched on the the racial polarization that's my word i think you were you know alluding to that um the lens sometimes that he sees things through quite mm -hmm. frankly again i know i know uh stephen bradford and get along uh, like you said we, we got along very well he's a good golfer I, <laughs> well listen everybody's a better golfer than i am i yeah, i could too. barely caddy yeah so um but when it comes to public policy you know, being a nice guy is not the end game. It's doing what's right for society. It's doing what's right for the individual. It's doing what's right for the the rule of law and the civil society. To go back to some of our our intro points here that we make every time we come on the air, this is what it comes down to. It's not about feeling good. It's not about retribution. It's not about uh, um, you know payback from past evils that are absolutely real. It's about what we do now to keep people safe, to hold people accountable, to encourage people to engage in self-responsibility and to see everybody as equals, which I know is a really, really bad thing to wish for now because we have to focus on uh, equity, not equality. And uh, well, let me I'm just, just not let me one just of those remind people. you something though, that I wish that uh, behavior was uh, committed in an equitable manner, right? That would make it easy. But unfortunately, that's not real. And so when they try to redirect attention away from the behavior and on the accuser, which is quite successful, I mean, they do it all the time and they do it quite successfully, it misses the mark. It misses the mark on uh, what's really in the interest of justice. And uh, I, I've been the uh, vice chair on the assembly side. He's on the Senate side and I'm on the assembly side uh, of the of the public safety committee. And uh, my goodness, if, if you would have to sit in my seat and listen to what I listen to routinely, and we're probably one of the most aggressive uh, legislative committees because there's a lot of public safety perspectives that uh, get passed every year. And in my opinion, mm -hmm. that lead to a, a more dangerous society and not a more safe society. But uh, the focus is it's, it's, <coughs> They, they try to make the perpetrators be the victim. And uh, they're, they're quite skilled in doing that. And it really is uh, an injustice to uh, what we all deserve, which is a safer society. Well, it's, it's really interesting that you, you focus on that about making really the perpetrators uh, the victims and, and the law enforcers um, the criminals. I've told people for a while since I've been looking at this bill, you know, go through the mill. Which, of course, you voted against, uh, and uh, of course, so proud of you. Not surprised, but proud of you. But I tell people, and we'll get into the, the, the text of this and some quote unquote background on it. But the way I see this, this is a very poorly veiled attack on law enforcement. It may look like other otherwise. It may look like, hey, we're trying to protect the innocent people. We're trying to keep people from being unfairly targeted. That's not it. That is not it. This is an attack on law enforcement. Uh, in law enforcement, this is an attempt to neuter law enforcement. This is an attempt to separate the law enforcers from the law violators. Hey, if I, if I which, could interrupt you just real quickly, yeah, please do. You used the word veiled. I don't even think it's that veiled. I think it's very boldly, yeah. I said poorly uh, unveiled. An affront. And as a matter of fact, I confronted him in uh, when it was on the assembly side with this issue that it was an attack against uh, law enforcement because there's a lot of uh, pot because he wants to remove, you know, law enforcement from campuses altogether. And I told him that uh, there's actually learning opportunities there that can actually build trust back. And uh, that's when he uh, bounced back and accused the entire law enforcement profession. Uh, to fall under the same kind of, uh, I don't know, poor judgment that was exercised in Uvalde and saying that, you know, this is what happens. You, you have a bunch of cowards with, uh, with guns and badges waiting outside while uh, young children are being murdered. And I, I have to tell you, it took about everything I had to keep my mouth in control. I was so infuriated by that and so insulted. Um, but that's, that's the place he comes from. It's a sick comparison. It's not even a. It's not even a good comparison. I mean, it, it. It's a. It's an evil comparison. Um, 
listen, I think you and I are on the same page about Evaldi, which is a whole different podcast and a whole different encyclopedia. That was an embarrassment. Um, that, I mean, at, put it it was an embarrassment to law enforcement. Yes, to put up mildly, you're absolutely right. But to make that, to compare that to officers responding to uh, these calls on campuses. And by the way, with that kind of segue, let, let me read a, a summary and a little bit of background so our audience knows exactly what you're dealing with there. And not just this bill, but this bill to me kind of exemplifies the craziness, it does. Uh, no, the it's a good absolute one. absurdity of what's going on. Now, listen to this. So here's a summary. SB, state, uh, state uh, Senate bill, Senate bill 1273 will eliminate the mandatory requirement that schools notify law enforcement for student behavior categorized as an assault or minor possession of cannabis or alcohol and protect students from unnecessary contact with the criminal justice system. Now, again, I'm just reading the summary here for time's sake, and we can dive deeper into it. But these assaults, um, disruption of public proceedings, uh, possession of certain weapons, I believe that actually firearms are exempt from this proposal, I they believe. Are. But weapons, yeah. So there's a ton more stuff in here that, look, when you and I, we're, we're about four years apart in age. So let's say we're the same age as far as public schools and schools we mm -hmm. grew up in the 60s and 70s and one public school, that the things we're talking about that they don't want cops to respond to or get notified of, I mean, it's like a twilight zone. That Can you imagine some kid having weed or some kid assaulting a teacher and not having a law, a law enforcement respond? Absolutely crazy. So let me go back to the background. This comes from, from Bradford's own website. Background. Decades of research show the long-term harm to young people of even minimal contact with the juvenile or criminal justice systems. Once students make contact with these systems, they are less likely to graduate high school and more likely to wind up in jail or prison. Now, and it goes on, we can talk about more, but the the idea, the notion that the that cops responding, like you said earlier, Tom, like you said earlier, responding to a school at the request of a teacher or administrator based on the behavior of a child, somehow is turned around that the cops responding is causing the child to behave in an unacceptable way. This is something that with anybody with two brain cells would understand the absurdity and the backward nature of this kind of statement. Yeah, I mean, we all have heard the statement that has encouraged uh, nationwide about uh, the importance it is to speak up and uh, when you see something to say something. And this is just to the contrary. This is see something, say nothing. And that's what I told Bradford to his face. And uh, that's when he fired back with Uvalde. So he was very, very irritated by, and I meant not to insult him. I meant to just show the absurdity of uh, this particular policy because you know, the, it also shows how they can twist statistics because they make it sound like the contact was the reason for these negative outcomes. It's because the, the behavior progressed and, and did not diminish that that has those negative outcomes. Behavior gets dismissed and excused at every turn. At every turn, they make it sound like because if you don't have a lot of uh, income, that you're turned to crime. And I think that that's an insult to people who have minimal income. My, my family came from very, very little and uh, my dad came from abject poverty and he would be extremely insulted if they made that, uh, that, that comparison that uh, poor people are uh, relegated to, to criminal conduct because they are not. Um, they, well, well I, I will tell you this, that I, I think that uh, when, when you do have a, dep a depressed neighborhood, that uh, there is there's dysfunction and, and there's there's greater challenge for sure, but uh, to to try to equate the fact that law enforcement is responding to an incident and and blaming uh, future misconduct by an individual because of that response goes beyond reason and it uh, it goes to show you how this legislature in majority actually thinks and it's very disturbing truthfully. Yeah, it is serving, and 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 correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a super majority of Democrats, mm -hmm. correct? And so Republicans like you are are 
warriors because you know what you're mm -hmm. up against uh, uh, electoral wise, numbers wise, but you're still doing the right thing and hanging your rear and out there to do everything you can to make it safer for us. The next paragraph of this background is also something that you touched on really off the top of the show about the racial aspect of this as far as Bradford's concerned. Um, and also, you know, what you said about your your father coming from, from absolute poverty is something else that you and I have common besides the California High Patrol and besides our, our really devotion to the rule of law. It, my dad grew up poor, black, in the Depression, in the Deep South, and his mother was murdered when she was 37 years old. His father was on the road. And people who have uh, listened to the podcast have probably heard the story before. But to summarize, my father was, again, black, dirt poor, in the Depression, in the Deep South. My father was literally, if you could afford it, he was the one who rode in the back of the bus. That was my father. It's not a history book. And he served in World War II. Uh, uh, got married when, when he was 21 years old, 60 years of marriage the day he died, raised five kids, four good ones and me, and put put four of his five kids through college, had owned three homes before he died on a 12th grade, edu uh, I'm sorry, a seventh grade education uh, under those circumstances. I think to kind of sum up what we said a minute ago about the cause effect, I'm a big believer and quite frankly, uh, Tom, the the numbers show it, the stats show it, history shows it, that poverty does not cause crime, but crime most certainly causes well said. poverty. This is this is what happens. And so when we have, quite frankly, and again, I've gotten along with Stephen Bradford over the year, it's been a lot of functions, we've emceed events together, but we got to call it out as it is. And this to me is race baiting when you interject something like this, this next paragraph. Our existing system has led to alarming disparities in the type of students who are most likely to suffer these harms. Guess what's coming next? Black students, Latinx or Latinx, sorry, I never learned how to pronounce it correct, uh, correctly and never will. Students, students of color, and students with disabilities are disproportionately referred to law enforcement, cited, and arrested. Now, i got to tell you right now, I guess if you let's look at the raw numbers, I, I, I guess you can fabricate or make the argument that more black kids are referred to law enforcement. Maybe, I, I, my guess is, quite frankly, that maybe more juveniles, uh, black juveniles, are committing crime, like you said earlier on. And so, I mean, that's why it's happening. But my God, students with disabilities get referred to law enforcement at a higher rate than students without disabilities. I This is a new one of me. I think they're pulling all the stops on, on this. It, this, is, this is nothing but a way to excuse bad behavior and nothing but a way to vilify cops in the law enforcement profession. So... I applaud, uh, applaud you on on what you're doing so far. There's more to this. I want to turn it back over to you because I know, like me, you probably have a lot to say. So go no, ahead. Really, I, I think you did a nice job of, of framing the uh, the perspective that, that gets skewed so effectively, truthfully. Um, and you ought to see the, the amount of people that they parade in the committee meetings. I don't know where they find uh, the people that they bring into that committee hearing. Um, but they, they pack the room and there's, there's probably anywhere between 30, 35, 40 people. And they all have a, uh, a story of how they were mistreated by the system and how they had, uh, you know, difficult circumstances and how they all serve time. And they are now fighting for, uh, social justice. And, um, it's the, it's the system that is to blame for, uh, the dysfunction that happens in our society and that uh, if we could just look the other way, which is exactly what this Bradford bill is asking us to do, just kind of dismiss it um, and just let things, you know, if it's, if no one dies, it must be okay. I mean, what, what in the world are we thinking to uh, not take action when there's inappropriate uh, conduct that there's, there's no form of justice in that, that kind of mentality. And, you know, you, you mentioned, how, how our society has changed. Both of our fathers are great examples of, of American success stories. My, 
My father started smoking at age eight because he was starving. His father died at a, when he was very young, um, and it was from World War uh, Two or World War One, actually, that that his father was uh, developed a respiratory condition that that ended his life at a very early age. So my 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 father was basically fatherless most of his life, and so they they struggled through a farming background, and he really really had nothing. And he ended up joining the military, and that's where he found out he had actually had science acumen. And he ended up putting himself through school on the GI Bill, and he became a dentist, truthfully, and uh, all on his own. I mean, no, no government intervention. And that's when he would he became the first Republican in his family. And uh, not that Republicans have <laughs> have the corner on the market on on uh, you know proper perspective, but. Uh, I, I happen to be a Republican myself, not that that's relevant, but uh, I, I am in the super uh, minority and I don't care. I don't care about the, those. I mean, I do care. I wish that there were more people that shared it more. Uh, I don't know and what I would say, healthy perspective. But um, you know what? It's a lot of a lot of the great ideas, not so much in the public safety arena, but a lot of the ideas in our culture have come from the Democratic side. So we, we're both. We're better when we listen to each other instead of fighting and demeaning each other. And um, they've got so many now that uh, it's like uh, screaming in a church, right? I mean, it's your your voice gets pretty loud because you're the only one that that's making mm-hmm. that that chant. And so yeah. that is opportunity that I I relish and I'm thankful for, and uh, I I try not to uh, you know be in their face. Because that, then you even have less. Your only hope is to get their ear. And uh, even though they might not act on, on the words that you express, if you can penetrate them, that's movement. And it might not be seen at that particular point, but eventually it will. And I, I've been doing this now for eight years, and I've seen movement. And so I'm, I'm thankful for, for this opportunity. And I think all of us need to uh, be active. Be active, active, active. And don't apologize for... Uh, something that differs from the other person, even if they try to tear you down, be strong. Mm-hmm. Well, Tom, you, you're clearly a leader, and and I I echo your sentiments about be strong and you know show some courage. It doesn't take much. You don't have to go out and be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a frontline general, but you have to do little things every day to stand up for your values. And you talk about uh, being a Republican. Look. The, the last Republican my dad voted for was actually President Eisenhower because President Eisenhower actually integrated mm-hmm. armed services. My dad s- served in a segregated armed services in World War II. And uh, President Eisenhower integrated, integrated these services. My dad voted for him. And that was the last Republican that my father voted for. And it was the last Republican that anyone in our immediate family voted for until yours truly in 1984 with President Reagan. And if you can imagine um, the flack, for lack of a more colorful world, uh, word, that I got as a 21-year-old, I just missed the 1980 election by just by uh, actually almost about a year. I was 17. But And by the way, I probably would have voted for Jimmy Carter uh, at that point. But that's how much I changed in four years. The reason I share this with, with everyone listening is, is that right or wrong, you can agree with Democrats, or agree with Republicans, or they're wrong, they're right, whatever it is. The point is, if for me, at 21 years old, that took a lot of courage to tell my mother that I was voting for Ronald Reagan. She thought that she had spawned <laughs> Satan. Okay. And it was not easy. It probably would have been easier changing religious, you know, religions going from a Methodist to, you know, maybe Judaism or something. My mom probably would have understood that better than me going from supporting Jimmy Carter, which I did as a senior in high school, to now voting for Ronald Reagan. But the reason I did that is because the irony, and this is where people like you really exemplify this, the the irony is, is that the principle principles my parents taught me to adhere to, taught me to honor, in my opinion, it could be wrong, but in my opinion, those principles didn't change from, you know, when I was younger until I was in my, you know, late teens, early 20s. My principles didn't change. It seems to me that the parties changed. And so instead of following a party name, 
I followed my principles and said, which one of these parties more, by no means perfectly, but which one of these parties more aligns with the principles that I was reared on, that I still hold dear at 21 years old, and I still hold dear at 59 years old. And I had to make, you know, I had to make a logical decision. Neither party is perfect, but the Republicans, Ronald Reagan, more aligns to me with Jimmy Carter. So what you're saying is it's not a, it's not an assault on the Democrat Party, although I'm fine doing that, quite frankly, I'd be, be honest about it. But, but what you're talking about is, it's being courageous and standing up for what you believe. And that's what you're doing. Um, and I, I couldn't be happier and more grateful that you and others uh, in the legislature, both uh, the, you know, the assembly and the, uh, and the senator doing that, um, whether a Democrat or Republican, doing the right thing for public safety. Uh, and quite frankly, I haven't seen a lot of Democrats doing that. That's why I'm not, I'm just not very um, kind about the party as a whole uh, right now. Uh, you know, one of the more thing I'm going to touch on with this, and we can move on to some of other topics and, and uh, just kind of get enlightened by your experience as an elected official. But a couple of the bullet points here are un under solution. Again, you can all go to Stephen Bradford's website here, um, representative of the 31st District Senatorial District here in Southern California. One, eliminating state mandates for school notification of law enforcement, thereby encouraging schools to adopt non-punitive, supportive, tra uh, trauma-informed. Now, I need someone to explain some of these phrases to me. Trauma-informed and health-based approaches to school-related behaviors. That and the vernacular is a lot of, you know, gobbledy, gobble, I can't even say it, a lot of junk. Um, Trauma-informed and health-based approaches. I guess, in other words, instead of expelling a kid or actually handcuffing them, taking them off, they want some other more... Um, uh, uh, big picture, real round, or, uh, rounded kind of, of action. I don't get it. Increasing educator discretion in determining when to notify law enforcement about students' related behaviors. Now, here's what I'm going to kick on, uh, 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 hit on this here. Increasing educator discretion in determining when to notify law enforcement about a student's school related behaviors. Translate you better not be calling the cops on kids of color. People may think that's pure cynicism. It is not. Whenever you see increasing educator discretion, aka re-educating, this is intimidation. That's what this is. Make no mistake about it. This is a sit to, uh, teachers down and tell them too many kids of color are being referred to law enforcement. Don't you be one doing it or getting called on it. I know that from the bottom of my soul. That's what the well, an African American can actually what, make What's your that take statement? on that? But, well, I can make you it. You can too, Tom. Uh, automatically, I'm dismissed <laughs> as, a, as a racist. And really, that, that's, that's just that's the reality. I mean, Well, hey, let me chime in. Let me chime in. I am dismissed yep. as an Uncle Tom, a sellout, a house Negro, an Oreo. You name it. I've been called it. And instead of actually dealing with the issues, dealing with the information, making an intelligent, informed re rebuttal to a point I make, I get called names. And this is why I have very little patience for the people that somehow you actually deal with probably on a more cordial basis than I would if I were in your new position. You're a better man than I. Because I've been called those names. I've been accused of those types of things simply because I have a dissenting opinion from the Well, it's because crowd. they've been very, very effective in, uh, in doing this canceling thing. Uh, because it, what it does is it, uh, it displaces the focus mm -hmm. on against... Again, the messenger and not the message, because they know that the message is toxic and they, they want to stay away from that. And so they go towards the messenger and that's a soft target. Um, you, they can make any allegation and uh, they do so pretty convincingly in their circles. And uh, that's essentially the, uh, the world that we're facing today. And that's why there's so much more division than needs be is because of this name calling. This name calling has uh, become a habit by both the left and the right. And it's really divisive and it's, it really gets away from democratic thinking.
in all honesty, and I don't mean that by party, I mean it by the system that, that we've adopted. And I, uh, I, I find it to be very, very hurtful. And, uh, and it, it's uh, not only toxic, but it's, it's destroying what we need the most right now. And that is uh, collective thinking, because that's when we're better, right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. the beauty of, of America, and has always been the beauty of America, is its, uh, its multiplicity of thinking, right? So many different cultures and bringing the good from those cultures and uh, making it into a, a unified culture, right? That's why it was called the United States of America. When, when right now, I don't know, it's almost laughable mm -hmm. to call us the United States because we're very divided, uh, more than in my lifetime than I've ever seen. Of course, it was pretty bad in the, in the early 70s, late 60s too, to be truthful. But uh, we're at least as bad as we were then. Uh, I, but I, I, I find it to be, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up for anybody that has any title and say, let's knock this off. And let's start uh, focusing on what's in common, right? And we're talking about public safety. What's in common is we all want to, we want to feel safe. We want our kids to feel safe when they're at school. And if we're ignoring these inappropriate behaviors by not uh, bringing in people who have been put in the position to enforce these rules, what in the world are we doing? We're destroying safety. Mm -hmm. Well, I... You, you put it perfectly. This is one of those very basic common values you would think that two parties in a, I guess, still free society could share. And uh, it, it's it's like the Twilight Zone that we're having, you know, this discussion about criminal behavior in school campus and and, and why it's a bad thing to, to uh, for have administrators call the cops. Let me ask you this, to, to kind of put a bow around this particular topic. Can can we stop this? Is there anything that we can do? Or do you see this actually becoming a law, a revising current law, Tom? Um, what do you think? If I understand it correctly, I think this has gone to the governor's desk. Um, and so he, he, he's got until... I believe so. What, uh, I think October to actually sign this into law or actually veto it. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll see exactly what happens. But uh, I'm pretty sure that this, uh, this sailed right through. And um, I don't know. I mean, with, with the mood of the legislature, yeah. it's, it's time to be careful. And here's, uh, here's another thing is public schools are, are really where our culture has developed. Uh, from decade to decade, and I, I would like to see that continue. However, um, some of the public schools have become entrenched in in political uh, shaping, and I, I think that's super dangerous. And that's why there's become competition even in the public arena. That uh, and, and a lot of people are resorting to homeschooling, which uh, I, I don't think is is the most healthy way to go. But parents know best, right? And unfortunately, I think what socialization is, is as critical as any academic instruction that they get from from our our, uh, our instructive system. So I, I think it's much harder to get that when you homeschool a child uh, because dealing with difficult people and is, is a skill that you never get away from. It's just reality. And when you take a child out of that mm -hmm. kind of ability to uh, to not interact, I think it's a disadvantage to all involved, including our own culture. And plus, the the more good examples that are, are taken out of our our uh, general education system, the more difficult it becomes, right? And so um, I, I I think balance is good, and I think choice is good because those are two principles that this country has uh, relied upon, and uh, what makes us different from the rest of the world. And I I hope that we can uh, all rally around those principles and uh, be strong advocates. And I don't care what party you're from; I really don't. I mean, just to, as a point of interest, I've represented uh, a Democrat dominant district my entire time as a Republican, and everywhere, it's no secret that I'm a Republican. So I, and I, I don't say that to pat myself on the back. I'm just saying what, what you can do is focus on commonality. Commonality is what wins. And uh, I, I don't have to be fake. I don't have to betray anything. I just stand up and I say what I think people deserve to hear. And uh, it's it's unifying 
It really is. And so it can happen if, if we all just are a little more sensitive to people who may not share our perspective. Uh, like even when I, when I spoke to uh, Senator Bradford, I tried to be very respectful, but he turned it on its ear really, really quickly with the Uvalde thing. But uh, sometimes you have to be bold. So it just depends on, on the discussion point. But I'm very thankful. And I, I, I think it's not time to panic as, as Californians, but it is time to really engage and, and pay attention. Well, yeah, uh, I agree with you that engagement is is uh, is essential. It's essential, you know. Whatever form, staying engaged with people of different differing views is essential. I will say this: couple of things on the homeschool. I um, I generally am a big supporter of homeschooling. Because um, I want people on the on the podcast to know that even you, you and I are not lobster mm-hmm. uh, lobster lockstep on on everything um but i will agree with you on this the one aspect that of it of it that i wonder about is the the social aspect um i have a lot of friends who who homeschool their kids and they find that socialization through other other methods Mm -hmm. through sports through other clubs things like that um but i understand that concern however i think that homeschooling is under the current circumstances we're dealing with in public schools um, I think it's a really, really good option. The other thing is I'm a big believer in competition. I think the more pressure that we actually put on public schools to do better, they will. As long as we keep acquiescing to whatever crap they keep teaching our kids and whatever political, uh, you know, uh, positions they keep Chief, pushing, let me, the more let me just clarify. It. When you say stop, um, I, yeah. I didn't mean to mislead yeah. because uh, some mm-hmm. of the the most uh, some of the strongest young people I know right now were homeschooled. Um, It it is a very successful option. And right now, because of the degree to which there's been indoctrination in our in our coursework now that I I find it to be a very viable option. I'm just saying that uh, our culture has always relied on the school system to be the uh, the real. Right. I don't know, impetus for cultural values. But now the values are starting to become very objectionable. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I totally understand the uh, and it's really growing uh, the amount of people that are wanting to do homeschooling and yeah. charter schooling is another great choice um, that's publicly funded. I think all these competitive pieces are very much an American thing. And you're right. Com- competition makes us all better. And uh, I, I think it is a it's a good option. I, I just worry about our public schools. Sure. I, I listen. I understand. I want public schools to succeed. I want them to be uh, a viable, healthy part of of our society. They should be. Um, but I thought you said you said it very well. That it's, it's up to each parent. And I I hope the pushback to some degree makes the schools better. But we shall see. That's a long term thing. It's been a long term coming to get where we are now. It won't be an overnight fix. But uh, I hope we get there. Um, you know, the, the final thing that I'll say about this, I said, I know I said 10 minutes ago, we'll put a ribbon on this, but the irony about this, about, well, and by the way, not, not just this, uh, SB 1273, but about, uh, decarceration, uh, uh, the reduction in penalties for certain crimes, the sad reality, the sad irony, because most of this is coming from people like Stephen Bradford, these types of different, um, uh, uh, philosophies and programs and bills and laws, things like this. But the sad irony is, Representative Blackie, is that the vast majority of people who are victimized are people supposedly being protected by these laws, and that is the uh, Black community, the Hispanic community. It's disproportionately affecting in other words, criminals being released early, criminals not being arrested, criminals not being prosecuted, criminals not being held accountable, uh, criminals not being uh, incarcerated for a proper length for, uh, for the given crime. They go back to the communities where they came from. That's just mm-hmm. whether you're white, black, wherever you live. But these people are not coming out of Brentwood. They're not coming out of Fair Oaks. They're not coming out of, uh, you know, uh, of, of Marin County. They're coming out of the place where I grew up. Imperial and Avalon in Southeast Los Angeles in the 1960s. They're coming out of these people, these places that are already overburdened with crime. 
and they're going to go back or they're going to stay there if they're let out early or if they're not prosecuted and arrested in the first place. So the people that you purport to, to help are being disproportionately negatively affected by these silly, ridiculous bills and laws that are being passed in the state. And it's an absolute travesty uh, by the people who are supposed to be advocates for people of color. I find it uh, ironic and sad. So um, we could talk about this all night, but I think that, you know, together you and I have kind of you know, made the point on that one. What What is your, um, what is your outlook for the legislature? Um, Tom, what, what's your outlook for the political, um, the political process in the state? Uh, is California going to stay uh, in this, again, super majority run uh, configuration for the rest of our lives? Or do you see any light at the, at the end of the tunnel for at least yeah, I some think real the balance, balance? Well, uh, rebound slowly. It's going to be very slowly. And unfortunately, there's going to be a needless tragedy along the way. It's just uh, what what we've allowed to happen. And I think what's happening is uh, I, I guarantee you there are people listening to this podcast that uh, also know many people that are, they have uh, decided to leave the state, right? Especially though many of our retired friends have uh, decided that it's, it's time that California <laughs> is becoming um, very, very discouraging. It's the cost of living is much higher. The, the safety piece is, is starting to erode and uh, there's too many good choices out there. Um, but, but I do think that if those of us who, who, know and understand the value of uh, winning principles and, and, and the value system that we all deserve to win from, uh, we can make an impact and we can start to make it to improve. And that's what has to happen. I'm not saying it, it will happen. It'll only happen if those of us who share these perspectives get engaged, right? I mean, you, I mean I'm a highway patrolman by my, my life uh, definition, not a legislator. I, it, it's really quite alarming that I made the that I'm in the legislature. It, it's it's quite a weird set of circumstances, but I, I'm, I'm I've, I will tell you that uh, it's because I feel passionately about staying engaged, and uh, you don't have to be a legislator to be impactful. There's especially in your local communities. There's much opportunity to be involved in, in school board decisions and even water board decisions or, or some kind of, uh, there's hospital boards, there's city councils, and there's, there's all sorts of opportunity to be engaged. And I hope that uh, those of us who, are, who share the, these values, a part of uh, your Leo nation, uh, would speak up and get active because really that's what makes the difference and that's really how you fix screwed up values right and, and things are goofy things are really really goofy and there's a lot of confused people um and they they might not uh, totally admit it but a lot of people are very unprincipled right now and they, they just don't know where they are and so we need to help them understand that and understand the benefit of uh, making good choices and supporting the right things man I, you said it you said it well doesn't matter who you are, what your walk of life is, you can always make an impact. And going back to what you said earlier about engaging people. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for you out there listening, what, what the representative just said is so true. Take some action. Don't be a victim. Don't complain unless you're willing to go out there and, and, and do something whether it's it, it, whatever it is, the action's up to you, but do something positive. If you're donating five bucks to a particular candidate, if you are commenting on social media in support of a, a principle, a, a bill, whatever it is, but be a part of the process. We can all complain about it. And God knows that I do probably too often, but I'm also uh, doing something, you know, in this form of your Leo nation to try to actually turn the tide, stem the tide against law enforcement. Um, we all don't have to do this, but we can all do something. And and uh, like the representative just said, it's up to us. You be the, your own engine of change. It can be one person at a time. It can be one step at a time. But there are 40 million people in this state and really just a very, very small percentage do something. Uh, we can actually, you know, make big waves in a positive way. I believe that. Uh, 
Representative uh, Lackey, I know you are up for election. Um, I know you have your beloved 36th district that you represent. You said you've been there eight years. And uh, I, I'm very happy for the people that you represent. And I'm, I've been looking at uh, your website and there is uh, someone here uh, who I don't know personally, but I know through reputation, State Senator Melissa Melendez, and she has endorsed you. She's uh, um, actually, yeah, she she has endorsed you. Um, Don't actually, read the new district. district I'm currently 36, right? I said but 36. they redistricted our area, so we will be 36. It will be 36. Will be. Okay. All right. Because you know what? When I run out of toes and fingers, my numbers go out the window. So, uh, but I, I'm glad I got that one somewhat right. But let me let me just uh, read to the audience what what uh, uh, Senator Melendez said in her endorsement of you. It says in, in announcing her support for Lackey, Senator Melendez stated, "There is no other candidate who more deeply understands how important it is to protect." The public where other candidates do a lot of talking about what they protect how they protect the public if only you'd elect them tom wore the uniform for 28 years because he believes in the cause not the applause i respect him and most importantly i trust him senator melendez is a she is a stalwart she's been a warrior like you have and to get an endorsement like that and she really hits on the public safety aspect and the fact that you understand this and god knows you do from three decades of law enforcement with the chp uh, i think it's a resounding endorsement for what it's worth you're getting my endorsement uh chief mark garrett retired california high patrol and uh, we need more people like you and uh, uh, in state government and government in general. So with that, I would like to and you'll give you the last word, anything else you'd like to talk about. And certainly you tell people where they can go to uh, drop a few uh, shekels in the box here. All right. Well, let me just campaign. say that it, it's been a, a pleasure spending uh, a few minutes here discussing some of these really powerful issues, truthfully. I mean, the, this is how it works. The, the system takes it bit by bit by bit. And uh, this uh, this bill that Mr. Bradford pushed is uh, a push in the wrong direction. So those of us who are uh, of the mindset that understand that the rule of law deserves to be protected and that uh, we need to try to prevent victims, uh, th this kind of policy does just the opposite. And it, it, it creates a, a free for all for for victims in the school system. So um, I'm very, very proud to uh, have a chance to to speak to these issues. And it's still kind of weird for me to imagine that I'm in the state legislature because of my, I, I'm not wealthy. I, I really am not uh, what a lot of politicians think they are. Um, I'm just a person that, uh, a, a regular walk of life individual, just like everybody that's listening to this this podcast with great opportunity and i've i've had uh, great influencers that have uh, taken interest in, in trying to allow me to to hold office but what i'm hoping everybody understands is that change comes slow especially in a big circle but you can have effective change in smaller circles immediately and so that's how really how it grows it starts out small and, and it grows um, just like a plant just like a human being and uh, I, I hope that all of you will be proud, be proud and understand and be tasteful in the, in the way that you uh, push for change, because we can make it happen and we need to make it happen. And uh, if, uh, if you believe in, in what I believe in and, and you're a, a Leo Nation individual, I guarantee you we're, we're like minded. And uh, you can go to my website, lackeyforassembly.com and find out more. And if you feel compelled to give me a couple bucks, we're going to need it because my opponent claims to be a law enforcement dude, and he's also a Republican, so it makes it very awkward. But uh, he's just a much different kind of guy. And uh, I have four years left if I can get the votes, and uh, I hope to do so. And uh, thank you for allowing me on here, Chief. It, it, it was an honor, and I'm thankful that you uh, gave me a chance to uh, express some opinions. 
Well, Representative Tom Blackie, it was our honor as well. Thank you for giving us the time, the insight, and really kind of a, a, a look into uh, what happens up there in Sacramento. God bless you. Best of luck to you. And uh, I look forward to talking with you in the future. Thanks for uh, thanks for fighting for uh, law abiding and law loving people in California. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that brings this episode to an end. It's been a lot of fun. Remember, right there over my shoulder, Your Leo Nation. Visit us at yourleonation.org. Uh, on that website, obviously, you can click on the Listen Now to get our all of our podcasts whenever you like. And also, if you click on the Donate button, that will take you to uh, the Leo Project, our nonprofit partner for Your Leo Nation. Just click on the Donate button. We are making every effort to donate to the families of fallen law enforcement officers uh not only here in california but across the nation so uh god bless everybody listening tom we'll be in touch have a great night